Hello again, I'm Dr. John Oldham, Chief of Staff at the Menninger Clinic, and welcome back to our program that we call Menninger Mindscape. We have a chance today to hear from a very, very distinguished uh, expert, um, Dr. David Arseniegas. David, welcome. Thank you, John. We're delighted to have you. Uh, to Dave, Dave is uh, relatively new to uh, Houston and the department, joining us from Denver and the University of Colorado almost two years ago. And I'm going to read his titles because they're pretty impressive. He's the Beth and Stuart Yudowski Brain Injury Chair um, for uh, the Department of Psychiatry. He's also the Executive Director of a new division that's the Division of Neuropsychiatry that's also called the Beth and Stuart Yudowski Division. He's Professor of Psychiatry, but also Neurology and PM&R, we call it, which is Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Um, he's Senior Scientist and Medical Director for Brain Injury Research at TIER, which is the Texas Institute for Research and Rehabilitation. So those are a lot of hats that you have, Dave. And um, it's all around the word neuropsychiatry. So why don't we start with your talking to us a little bit about what do we mean by neuropsychiatry, and then we'll zero in a little bit on an area that's a lot in the news today called traumatic brain injury. Sure. Well, neuropsychiatry really has three definitions. Um, when, when I'm asked this question, what is neuropsychiatry? The first answer is it's a philosophical approach to understanding brain behavior relationships. So it's an approach that transcends the mind-brain duality that separates those two things that transcends the guild-like considerations of neurology and psychiatry and really helps us understand mental events as brain events and an approach to understanding those things in health and disease. A second answer, that transdisciplinary approach is one that allows us to study and to teach about brain behavior relationships in a way that one can be doing things that are neuropsychiatric without being a neuropsychiatrist. As regards the medical subspecialty neuropsychiatry, it's that discipline that's interested in treating persons who are affected by illnesses, some we call psychiatric, some we call neuro neurologic traditionally, but that affect the way people think, the way they feel, and the way they behave as a result of that brain illness. Uh, put in other terms, we're interested in the cognitive, emotional, and behavioral consequences of neurologic illnesses and the neurology of psychiatric illnesses and in partnership with our colleagues in behavioral neurology, we practice in the subspecialty now known as behavioral neurology and neuropsychiatry. That's cool. And actually, I know a lot of people, well, at least a fair number, who argue that psychiatry and neurology ought to come together as one specialty. And I guess in some ways, I, I teach that psychiatric disorders are brain disorders. It all goes back to the brain. Uh, do you think that's a, that's a move that ought to be made, the neurology and psychiatry sort of moving closer together? Well, I think it's important for us to have an open conversation between neurology and psychiatry. Um, I think people who are trained in those disciplines bring different kinds of perspectives to brain illnesses. Um, and all of those perspectives are valuable. You know, um, I've heard the same people talk about, you know, psychiatry is neuropsychiatry or all psychiatry ought eventually to be mm -hmm. neuropsychiatry. Right. I think with the definitions I just offered, I would suggest that you know, neuropsychiatry is a part of mm -hmm. psychiatry right. in the same way that behavioral neurology is a part of neurology. Together, we offer a perspective on these brain illnesses that bridges the gaps that otherwise divide us into two different specialties. But I don't think that we should transform everything in psychiatry into neuropsychiatry. There's a, a rich history and a rich set of perspectives and language that comes from other perspectives beyond the neuropsychiatric perspective. And personally, I would hate for us in psychiatry to lose those perspectives in the interest of making everything scientific in the way that neuropsychiatrists yeah. sometimes do. No, I like that. I think that's a nice distinction. Well, one, one thing, there, there are many things we could talk about and we never have enough time, but, but one thing that is pretty clearly um, the, the business of neuropsychiatry is traumatic brain injury. And there's a lot in the news about that and, and ought to be today because it's a big issue. Talk to us about that. Sure. Well, I think um, traumatic brain injury is one of the quintessential neuropsychiatric disorders. In fact, as a little piece of medical history, it's interesting that neuropsychiatry, with that term coined, uh, originally by the U.S. Army actually has its roots in traumatic brain injury and PTSD. Um, in the ending portions of World War I, the first surgeon or chief surgeon of the Army, uh, Theodore Leister, 
recognized in the U.S. Expeditionary Forces that the clinicians they had deployed, neurologists and psychiatrists, to address cases of concussion and shell shock were neither individually experienced or knowledgeable enough to provide the full complement mm -hmm. of care that those persons actually needed and set about creating a cadre of true neuropsychiatrists, so named, as well as divisions of neuropsychiatry within the battalion hospitals in Europe to actually begin providing a more comprehensive and considered approach to persons with what we would now call traumatic brain injury and PTSD. That, that's interesting. I didn't and know that. So nearly 100 years later, we come back as neuropsychiatrists to this same issue, especially traumatic brain injury. Um, to be specific about what we mean by that now, traumatic brain injury actually has a federal definition, starting with the TBI Act of 1992, recodified through the 90s and now incorporated into the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders, common data elements for traumatic brain injury research. And the essence of the definition is that uh, traumatic brain injury involves the application of a biomechanical force to the brain that causes either functional or structural disruption of the brain and results in at least some transient disability, so tr trouble meeting the demands of everyday life. Those forces can include a direct blow to the head, which is what I think many people think mm -hmm. of, or a penetrating injury like a, a missile wound, a gunshot wound, for example, but often involve acceleration, deceleration of the sort you might have mm -hmm. in a car accident mm -hmm. without hitting your head on something, or potentially blast-induced injury, mm -hmm. as we've seen in many of our oh, sure. military sure. service members. The dysfunctional or structural disruption of brain typically uh, refers to either a loss of consciousness, a period of inability to remember new information at the time of the injury and for some period thereafter, or post-traumatic amnesia, the development of a frank confusional state such that somebody is really not themselves in the immediate period following it as a result of taking brain systems that organize behavior offline, or other neurological problems mm -hmm. like a, a half of the body not working or an inability to speak or, or similar things. Um, when those things occur in the context of an event where those forces are applied and there isn't another better explanation for those alterations in brain function or the structures underlying them, we then refer to that as a traumatic brain injury. Well, see, that's really interesting. And of course, it's in the news all over the place with regard to the military, and, and, and that's a huge concern, but also more and more in terms of contact sports. Yes. And so that's another area of, of really more in, enormous um, attention these days. Um, just, well, we've got a few more minutes. Um, I, I guess I would wonder, it, there must be an enormous range of quite, quite severe disabling TBI to less severe. Let's say somewhere in the middle, how possible is it, at least sometimes, for the brain that has been injured, we are using the word injury, to repair itself? So the good news is that our expectations in relation to most injuries is for recovery. Ideally for complete recovery, but if not complete, at least partial recovery. And as you might expect, the extent of recovery and our expectations for it varies with the initial injury severity. So the World Health Organization has done an exceptional job of outlining the prognosis after mild TBI, those injuries at mm -hmm. the less severe mm -hmm. initial end of the spectrum. Um, with a great report in 2004, and then just two months ago in the Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, an update from that same group, mm -hmm. and basically surveys the literature and concludes, as they did 10 years ago, that in relation to mild TBI, some 90% of people or more will be completely recovered by a year following injury. Many of them, wow. if they're in the sports world, will recover much, much quicker than that. So 20% typically within the first 24 hours, something in the neighborhood of 95% or so by 10 days with a residual who then take longer to recover and or may not recover completely. Isn't in the, that interesting? Those are new data and that's good news. It is good news. In yeah. the civilian world, recovery may take a little bit longer, but again, by six to 12 months, nearly 90% or more will actually have a complete recovery. So that's very good news. At the moderate and severe end, um, things are, uh, not as frequently uh, rosy on the back sure, end of it. Sure. Between a third and two thirds of people will end up with chronic mental health, neuropsychiatric, if you will, and or physical problems as a result of their injuries with the severity of initial injury increasing the likelihood of those problems and those problems when present 
increasing the likelihood of long-term disability. Yeah. Well, one of the things we're doing here in connection with the National Network of Depression Centers is trying to work with the National Football League Players Association to try to help retired players who are in the region who may be um, suffering from these kinds of things. We're out of time. It's always hard to stop. But what is great is to have you here with us to both be really expert in this area, help us at Baylor and help us here at Menninger evaluate and, and understand these disorders, but also collect, uh, as you're doing, a really top-notch group of researchers to keep learning more and more about it. And that's what you're in the middle of, I, I think. That is our goal. We hope to do Good. more of it over the next few Good. years, to be sure. Good. Thank you for having me, John. Well, thank you for joining us, Dave. And thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time.